Hello everyone and how's it going? It's me again with another video under the brand new channel, History 401. Recently, about almost a month ago, I should say, I put out a video on the meaning of berets worn by the British during World War II. And it was so successful that on the first day, I got 250 views. And I think now it's pushing 290 or 300. And I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for that. 250 does not sound like a lot, but someone like me who used to average, I think like 10, <laughs> 10 views for each one, 250 is a lot. And I thank you guys so much for that. And because of that boost in viewership, now this is part two of um, meanings there are the significance of berets during World War II. I did say I would make another version and this version, we're not going to be talking so much about British units, but there will be some in there but we're going to be talking more about the Commonwealth nations specifically. And um, this one's definitely going to be a lot more interesting because this is based on information that a lot of people, including myself, didn't even know before doing the research for this video. And I think it's going to be really interesting. So let's get started. The first beret color or the first beret type that we're going to be talking about is one that you probably have seen all across the, the all across the board in terms of well, World War II photography, but just be, it's because you simply may, I don't know. For me personally, I saw it, but I never really thought about it. But if you now that you watch this video, if you look back on some footage or some photographs, you probably will notice it. And that is the khaki colored beret worn by British and Commonwealth forces. I wanted to mention this one specifically because this one is worn across all the nations, across different types of soldiers for different types of different types of reasons and one um one method of its use i find a little bit childish but we'll get there when we get there but first off for the khaki beret it was primarily meant to be used by the reconnaissance corps and by the royal artillery it was also not that uncommon to be used by motor battalions which are essentially motorized infantry in an armored division so in the last video i said that if you were part of an armored division you wore the black beret well, if that mostly was the case for armored units or armored regiments, but if you were a motorized infantry battalion, you wore the khaki beret. It was also used by members of guards units. So you could, for example, mention the Coldstream Guards Regiment. The Coldstream Guards, I believe, is everyone knows them as, you know, the guys with the big, you know, furry hats and the red suits that walk around the Queen's Palace. Yeah, those are the Coldstream Guards. And it was also not common or not uncommon to see soldiers from the Scots Guards also wearing these as well. Another use that, I, like I said before, I thought it was kind of childish, was that lots of army officers ended up deciding to use the khaki beret simply because it was meant to be, one, the purpose of the khaki beret in general, it was meant to be more of like a like a supplement to the general service cap that I mentioned in the last video started to be issued around 1942, mostly because soldiers thought that uh, it was easier to shape. It looked more professional. It was it gave a more of a sharp appearance, but it was actually more common that army officers would need to do this. And it was more common for officers across the board to wear the khaki beret, not just because of the things I mentioned earlier, that it looks nice, it's easier to shape and it's easier to conform to your head, but it was it was also because a lot of these officers didn't want to get mixed in with the enlisted and then the working class sort of people. And to end the khaki beret segment and to transition, these were also used by Commonwealth forces. For example, in Canada, two uh, units known for wearing the khaki beret were the Royal Winnipeg Rifles and the Queen's Own Rifles. In New Zealand, it was used by the New Zealand Regiment and... In Australia, the khaki beret was used all across the board with their second Australian Imperial Force, which is their version of like the British Expeditionary Force, which is basically just all the Australian units just grouped up into one big sort of core or field army sent out into battle. This one I'm really excited to mention because somebody in the other video, uh, I think their name was Lynn Cromack, commented on the previous video and mentioned a type of beret called a cobbin or a cobbin i don't know how exactly you pronounce it and they mistaken the 11th hussars beret that i mentioned in the last video the one with the red band and the brown sort of crown beret as a cobbin and unfortunately it's 
incorrect, uh, but I'm happy to transition into the next piece of a beret, which is the Irish Cobbin. So as I have mentioned before, if you were part of a Scottish unit, especially an enlisted man, you wore the Scottish Tam O'Shanter. Well, if you were part of an Irish unit, subsequently, you wore the Irish Cobbin. And originally, these were meant to be created in a green color, but as the war progressed, especially as many Irish units would end up going to North Africa and Western Europe, they ended up deciding to switch those out for a khaki color, which is why sometimes people get these mistaken for the general service cap. Like I said before, Irish units were the ones issued out these uh, Irish Cobbin berets and another piece of a sort of a, another piece of the Cobbin that you would wear as part of your regiment or your battalion tradition was that certain Irish units wore what is called a hackle, which is a feather that you would attach to a band and you would wear it. No, if this is my right, you would wear it on the left side, right where the cap badge is over your left eye, and it would sort of stick out. And that was another way of showing what unit you were in and what sort of regiment you were a part of. They were known for coming in specific colors. So for example, the Liverpool Irish wore a red and blue hackle. The Royal Inniskilling Rifles wore a gray hackle. The Royal Irish Fusiliers wore a green hackle. The Irish Guards wore a blue hackle. The London Irish Rifles also wore a blue hackle and uh, funny enough, the Royal Ulster Rifles, which is one of the more recognized or well-known Irish units, didn't actually get a hackle until 1948. So they're sort of one of the only groups that actually didn't get to wear one. Speaking of Irish and Scottish units, in the last video, I hate saying in the last video, but I think this is going to be the last time, I promise. In the last video, I mentioned that Scottish units wore the Tam O'Shanter. Well, I unfortunately made the mistake that the Tam O'Shanter was more used for enlisted men. And again, Irish, uh, or should I say Scottish officers, just like any other officer, had a better headgear because again, they're meant to be more professional, more better looking, more sharp. And that's what we're going to be talking about next, which is the Scottish Balmoral Bonnet. Like I said, it's more mostly worn by Scottish regiments. Uh, actually, no, it's worn only by Scottish regiments. And it's just an, a, a fancier version of the Tam O'Shanter. It already has sort of the pulled to the right ear shape uh, when you get it. So it's basically already half shaped for you, but it has that nice sharp sort of right angle curve. So that way it just looks more professional. Whereas if you look at photos of the enlisted men's Tam O'Shanter, it kind of looks like a flat top, almost like a pizza box on the top of your head. For example, right now I'll put up a photo of a uh, Scottish enlisted men and a Scottish officer. The enlisted men is standing up and the officer is sitting down and you can see how, again, these provide very different looks and very different shapes and very different appearances. Hello, everyone. It is me from the future. And um, funny old thing. Um, so when I was making this video, right, I, I, I had already finished all of the editing. I had already worked on all of the... I edited it to make sure it was nice and good. I had good uh, images, I checked all my sources, and I saved the project and I never exported it. Meaning I never made it a file so that I can upload it to YouTube. And I had no particular reason why, I just did it. And then I put it off to work on other video or research projects. And uh, boy, am I glad I did that. Or should I say, am I glad that I didn't do it? Because I, I, oh, I found something interesting I think you guys might really appreciate. So obviously we're talking about, you know, berets and headgear worn by, um, by the British and the Commonwealth forces. And in the last video, which you should all go watch, um, and in this one, I mentioned that for Scottish units, enlisted men wore the Tam O'Shanter and, and Scottish officers wore the Balmoral or the Balmoral Bonnet, however they call it. And I said those were exclusively for Scottish regiments. And I, I had mentioned, uh, well, I didn't really mention any, but like if you look up Scottish regiments, you'll find out all the, you'll find the ones I, I, I talk about. But I found out two very, very important 
units in the British Army that also wore the Tam O'Shanter and the Balmoral. And those are commando units. Specifically, number two commando brigade and number 11 commando brigade. So, these commando units were specialized, specially trained men or soldiers that would be sent out into enemy territory to perform like a raid or like a hit and run attack on like an enemy position, right? And they accepted volunteers from all over. Um, so whatever unit you came from, whatever regiment you came from, whatever headgear you wore, that was just the, that was what you wore until around 1943, I should say. But number two and number 11 commando brigades were one of the first, if not the first commando units to have a bit of uniform uniformity. And that was by wearing or issuing out the Tam O'Shanter and the Balmoral to their ranks. And the reason why they did this was because number two commando uh, it's just known as number two commando and they recruited uh, from you know they recruited from like England and Scotland and you know all, all other all parts of the of the UK but their main demographic were the Liverpool Scottish so essentially the Scouse people which is why which is why for some reason out of all the accents in my personal opinion the Scouse accent is the most difficult to understand because it's close to Scottish but then you have number 11 commando that recruited exclusively from Scottish regiments which is why when you look them up on any research or any archives or any whatever even on Wikipedia they are known as number 11 um, what's that uh, parentheses Scottish commando and the number two commando wore the TAM just as is, and they had their own cap badge. It was a, a fighting knife pointing downwards with an S and with two S's in between. Now, number 11 commando, I don't remember their cap badge, but number commando wore the TAM O'Shanter, but they got to wear a black hackle. So if you remember in the segment I made about the Irish Cobbin, how Irish regiments had a, a, a hackle, which was like a feather on the left side by the, where the cat badge was. Yeah, number 11 commando had their own hackle and it was black. Um, I think because they kind of continue the vibe of like the commandos being like elite killing machines and everything else. So yeah, I almost forgot or I, I, I almost didn't put it into the video that number 11 and number two commandos also wore Tam O'Shanters, which I thought was very cool. <clears throat> Another look at a beret that I think deserves way more recognition is the Polish Gray Paratroopers Beret. This was used by members of the 1st Parachute Independent Brigade, or I think I said that wrong, the 1st Independent Polish Parachute Brigade, and these were made famous during Operation Market Garden, and if you've seen A Bridge Too Far, the character that Gene Hackman plays, uh, I think it's Major General Salzabowski, he is the guy in charge of the 1st Polish Parachute Brigade. And now we're going to be moving on to the last two berets, which marks the end of this video, the Chaucer Alpin and the Chaucer Adena berets. These were worn by, uh, I think it's French and Belgian mountain infantry troops, respectively. And these are, how can I explain this? These are just giant, giant berets that you wear just on top of your head. It genuinely looks like you're wearing a pillowcase. I'm sorry to the Chaucer Adena and the Chaucer Alpin. I really am sorry. <laughs> It just really does look like a giant pillowcase on your head. Uh, the Chaucer um, Alpin French Mountain Infantry were essentially wearing a dark blue or a black version that was pulled to the left ear. Everyone, including the U.S., wears the beret pulled to the right ear. Uh, but for some reason, France has a habit of just not following this tradition and they wear it to the left ear instead. So if it looks reversed, that's because it is. The final, final one, I promise, is the Chaucer Adena beret, which is made famous by 
the battle for the Ardennes region by a group of 40 Belgian mountain light infantry against an entire formation of German armor. If it sounds familiar, that's because one of the, if not the best bands out there, Sabaton, made an entire song about those guys. Their beret was also oversized and very, very huge, but not as much as the French. And unlike the French that pulled it to the left ear, the Belgians decided to follow the trend like everyone else and pull it to the right ear instead. And this was more of a, uh, I guess you can say it's like a, uh, like a weird, pale, almost like a pea soup green. Uh, I think it has to do with like the vegetation of the Ardennes forest, hence, is, hence that's why they were issued and tasked and deployed in the first place. And their cap badge is a, I don't want to say a huge badge, but it's a it's an impressively sized badge of a wild boar's head. And in case I haven't mentioned it already, their job specifically, based on the name, was to guard the Ardennes forest when the Germans were trying to invade France and they realized, well... Maybe it wouldn't be smart to invade France directly because they would have to face the Maginot Line, but instead go through the Ardennes to cut off the Belgians and the French in their defenses, and then, you know, they win. So that concludes my part two for the meaning of World War II berets. Again, guys, thank you so much for 200, and I think now 288 views. Again, that is the most I have ever gotten in any video I have ever made, and I really hope you guys stick around for that. But again, Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like and subscribe for more history content. I plan on making more World War II history videos later, but I also want to step away from that and make history videos in general. Pretty soon, I want to make movie reviews too, where I review specific historic or historic-based movies and give information on those too. But that will show up when it shows up. Uh, other than that, uh, I hope you all enjoy the video and I hope to see you guys again. Goodbye.